turn your Bibles to Hebrews 12. This will be our New Testament reading for today. As you guys know, we've been uh, going through in June a brief mini-series addressing the state of our nation, which has openly uh, supported and promoted uh, just the broad spectrum of immorality and wickedness. And we're living in a time where the sin of our nation is open, it's flaunted, and it's extremely hostile towards God and his people. And so we wanted to do this series to help to equip you all for how to live in a time such as this. You know, so many of us, all of us really, grew up in a time where the, we didn't have these broad concerns, at least not so out in the open, where, you know, the church was respected by the world in certain ways. This church was, you know, more prominent in the world. Now we're living in a time where we are more and more marginalized because the public spirit that has taken over is one of open hostility to God. And so that's why we want to do this series. And in Hebrews, this is kind of the, uh, the climax of the epistles to the Hebrews in chapter 12, uh, in which, you know, he's laid this, the author has laid this foundation of faith that we have rooted in God's covenant with his people. And he's now come to this point after he's gone through Hebrews 11, the, you know, the saints of old who suffered and served faithfully in this world, looking forward to their reward. And so on that basis, after going through all of the, you know, the firm foundation of the covenant, the testimony throughout history of God's people, people in their faithfulness, he comes and addresses the new covenant people, and he's telling them to stand firm like the saints of old did, trusting in God's work in the world, bringing about his glorious purposes. So Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2, we read, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And then over to verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So essentially, what he's saying there is that God has promised to shake the earth in such a way by his judging, his work of judgment, so that all the things of wickedness would fall away. And the thing that can't be shaken, the kingdom of God, is what would remain. And he's addressing Christians who have to go through some of these periods where God shakes the earth in judgment, as it were. And now please turn to Amos 6, which is going to be our text for this morning. And as you're going there, we got to give a little bit of background, a little bit of context, so that we know what we're talking about. So Amos, the prophet, is an early prophet in, in terms of the, uh, the prophets whose writings we have in Scripture. In fact, he might be the first canonical prophet in the Old Testament, the first one whose book we have in the Bible. Amos prophesied approximately 40 years or so before Israel's captivity to Assyria, before they were exiled. 
He reigned, uh, he prophesied during the reign of King Uzziah in Judah and King Jeroboam II in Israel. And so to give you just kind of, you know, place us in history, Isaiah began his prophetic ministry after King Uzziah died. So Amos is before Isaiah, about 40 years before the exile of the northern kingdom, during the reign of Jeroboam II in Israel. And you can read about his reign in 2 Kings 14 if you're curious. But Jeroboam was actually politically a very successful king in Israel. He won military victories. He won diplomatic victories. He secured the borders of Israel. And he brought a measure of stability and prosperity to the kingdom. And yet we're told that before God, he was an extremely wicked king, primarily because he, like so many of the kings that had gone before him, led the nation in idolatry. They worshiped idols instead of worshiping the one and only true and living God. And you have to think, you have to remember that at this point in the history of both Israel and Judah, but especially in Israel, in the northern kingdom, idolatry was pervasive. It was endemic. It was just the way things were. I mean, it was embedded into the culture. There had been generations. It was Solomon who first constructed the high places in Judah to appease his pagan wives. And then Jeroboam I, the first king of the split northern kingdom of Israel, erected high places so that the the people wouldn't travel to Jerusalem to worship so that they could worship in the northern kingdom. And so he built the high places for that purpose. And so it had been generations and generations of idol worship in the land of Israel, these altars to false gods. And so the idolatry was deeply rooted and it was rampant. And so even though this was a period of history where there was outward success and outward stability, inwardly and spiritually, Israel was absolutely in disarray. And if you turn back, go to Amos 2 real quick, just to see what was going on in the lands of Judah and Israel during this time. Amos 2 verse 4, we read, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but their lies have led them astray, those after which their fathers walked. And then down to verse six, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample on the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside from the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. And so you see there in the prophetic word against Israel and Judah that the lawlessness, the wickedness, the profanity was obvious. It was on the surface. It was public and outward facing The covenant, God's covenant law was disregarded and willfully transgressed. And so God raised up the prophets and sent them. And the role of the prophet, his vocation was as God's covenant prosecutor. He was like a prosecuting attorney who goes to the people because the covenant is a legal framework of God's relationship with his people. And so the prophet would go and point to the covenant law and say to God's people, you have disobeyed the law. Here's how you've disobeyed. And these are going to be the consequences unless you repent. And so the the prophet was an accuser in a sense of the people. He pointed out their sin and he called them to repentance and restoration. And so you see the, the profound reality of Israel's gift, uh, guilt, I'm sorry, even in the fact that they are prophesied against right alongside the pagan nations. The first chapter of Amos, he's prophesying judgment against the Philistines and the Moabites and the Ammonites and all the rest of them, the Assyrians. And then right after that, he goes straight into judgment against Judah and Israel. They were just as bad as the pagan nations. The judgment was coming. Disobedience to the law of God brings judgment. 
And so with all the wickedness that was going on in the nation, among the people, with all the clear covenant violations that they were guilty of, with the destructive consequences that were necessarily going to follow lawlessness, the people of God should have responded to the prophetic word with urgent repentance, with desperation to seek God's mercy and try to avoid the coming judgment but that's not what the people did. And so now the text, Amos chapter six, woe to those who are at ease in Zion and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, the notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes. Pass over to Calne and see and go from there to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory, O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence? Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent instruments of music for themselves who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The Lord God has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds, and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. And if 10 men remain in one house, they shall die. And when one's relative, the one who anoints him for burial, shall take him up to bring the bones out of the house and shall say to him who is in the innermost parts of the house, is there anyone alive with you? He shall say no. And he shall say silence. We must not mention the name of the Lord. For behold, The Lord commands, and the great house shall be struck down into fragments, and the little house into bits. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plow there with oxen? But you have turned justice into poison, and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood, you who rejoice in low debar, who say, have we not by our own strength captured Karnaim for ourselves? For behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. And they shall oppress you from Lebo Hamath to the brook of Arabah. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would be receptive to your word this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you have spoken to us clearly. I pray, Lord God, that you would work this message into our hearts so that it comes out in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So one thing that we have to understand as Christians, because sometimes when you read a text like this, we can be quick to misunderstand or make some hasty applications. Something that we need to understand is that rest is a good thing. God made man to work and to rest. We know that from creation. God worked the work of creation and rested on the seventh day. God set before Adam the promise of eternal rest when Adam would complete his work. Israel was given the Sabbath law for a pattern of work six days, rest one day. And in the New Testament, we're told, and it talks about striving after the rest that is set before us, striving to enter God's rest, that eternal Sabbath that was earned by the work of Jesus Christ. And so we, as image bearers of God, were designed to crave rest. God built this need and this desire into us, and it's a good thing. And even in this life, and even today, as Christians, as the body of Christ in the new covenant, even though this life is a struggle and a battle, and it's described as a war, Christians still participate in rest. Obviously, what we're doing today, the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day, is a day of rest. But even beyond that, there is a proper pursuit of peace and rest in our everyday lives. You know, in 1 Timothy, when we're told to pray for those in authority so that we may live quiet and peaceful lives honoring and serving God. So there is a good and proper desire for us today as Christians to live in such a way where we can serve God freely, 
openly, without great conflict, that's not something that's at odds with the gospel. We know that the people of Israel enjoyed this period of rest under King Solomon. In 1 Kings 4, verses 24 and 25, we read, He had dominion over all the region west of the Euphrates from Tephash to Gaza, over all the kings west of the Euphrates, and he had peace on all sides around him. And Judah and Israel lived in safety from Dan even to Beersheba, every man under his vine and under his fig tree all the days of Solomon. So Israel, during the reign of Solomon, had this period of consummated rest where there was wealth, there was prosperity, there were no wars, they had their borders secure, they had peace on all sides, and the people were enjoying the fruit of the covenant with God. And it was a blessing from God to be used for his service, to be received with gratitude, given thanks for, and then used for his service. But the problem is that Israel wanted the rest apart from the obedience. They wanted the fruit apart from the labor. They wanted to disobey, disregard God's law, and still get the good benefits from it. And so that's the thing. The reality of sin in this life makes an everlasting rest impossible. We know that rest ultimately is only going to come in eternity in the kingdom with Christ. But we do have real periods of rest in this life. But then sin comes in and disturbs and destroys that rest. And so in the new covenant... The church, we can enjoy similar periods of rest, sort of like what Israel enjoyed under Solomon. There are periods of church history where there is general, broad peace for God's people. And again, remember, this is always relative. There's always some battle to be fought somewhere. There's always some group of people who need the gospel to be brought to them. There's always points of doctrine that need to be corrected. There's always our own sin that we're fighting against, of course. But there are periods of time throughout church history where there is kind of general peace and rest for the people of God. However, because of the reality of sin, they cannot last forever. And so when sin erupts, when enemies arise, when God allows the enemies of his people to gain strength and power and to have a particular animosity towards the church, the natural and good desire that we have for rest and peace can very easily become a stumbling block. It can become a snare and a temptation. And especially when we act During these periods of judgment, when the enemies of God are on the move and are uh, are very active, when we act as though we are at peace, when we act as though it's a period of rest in the midst of the battle raging hot, then we're guilty of sin and the judgment is multiplied. We're ignoring the battle that God has called us to if we're pretending that things are all right when they're clearly not. And this is the condemnation of the people of Israel by the prophet Amos. They were living at ease and in luxury in the midst of rampant sin with judgment right on the horizon. The whole nation, from top to bottom, from the king on down, is guilty of pervasive and perverse sin. You know, we we read about it a little bit in chapter 2. Some of the description of the sin, the hatred of the poor and needy, the perversity of the uh, pagan worship and sort of the rituals and with the temple prostitutes that they would engage in. This was ugly, wicked sin completely contrary to the law of God that he had given them, and yet they were pursuing ease, security, comfort, rest, all the while the guilt piled up higher and higher. And he compares them very directly to the surrounding nations. We we, uh, mentioned earlier, chapter 1, prophesies against the pagan nations, goes straight into prophesying against Israel. But even here, He says in verse 2, pass over to Kalna and see, and go from there to Hamath the Great, go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory, O you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence? There's a direct comparison. God's people 
were supposed to be different. They were supposed to worship the one true and living God, and yet they were engaged in just the same sort of behavior that the pagan nations all around them were engaged in. And those pagan nations, he's saying, were mightier than they are, and God judged them. Can he not do the same to his own people, who's much smaller and less mighty? And this was the opposite effect that Israel was, was meant to have on her neighbors. If you turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8, we read, before the people, when they're ready to enter the promised land, and God is constituting his people and telling them, this is how you're to live when you enter into this land. He says, Deuteronomy 4, verse 5, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? Whenever we call upon him, and what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? See, God's people, they were given the law, which was good and just and glorious. They were given the covenant of God, and they were intended to have a salt and light type of effect on the surrounding nations. They were to live consistently with the law, and then the nations would see the justice and the goodness and the prosperity of the people of Israel, and they would say, what God do they serve who has laws so just and so righteous. This people is wise and understanding, and their God is good and near to them. Glory, justice, mercy, holiness dwelt in Israel alone at that time. Around the, the world was in deep darkness, and there was this one piece of light in the land of Israel that was to show to all the nations the glory of the Creator. They were to be a picture of God to the world. That was Israel's job. And so when they failed to do this, and instead they were influenced by the nations around them, and they adopted pagan practices, they failed for their whole reason for existing. It was a total failure of their mission as a nation. And then on top of this, to make it even worse for the people of Israel, as God's covenant people, they were the recipients of his mercy. They had directly experienced his deliverance, his power, his grace. They had received the law from God, from the mountain, written with the finger of God himself. And so for them to be unfaithful and idolatrous was unfathomable. They of all people, they knew God. They knew him personally and intimately. They had re uh, received revelation directly from God. They had experienced his mercy and his saving power. And then for them to go and turn around and serve idols in such a perverse, wicked way was unconscionable. Their status as a holy nation that was blessed by God made their sin even worse than the pagan nations. Amos says in verse 12, You have turned justice into poison and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. They took the good things of God, the good blessings of God, and they took it and twisted it and turned it to evil and wickedness and disobedience. And so in that sense, they were worse than the nations around them. And so if God didn't spare judgment on the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Philistines and the Assyrians and the Egyptians, would he spare judgment on his own people who knew better than these pagan nations? And for a long time, from the very start, Israel had been warned of the consequences for their disobedience. They were warned that if they ignored God's law, if they disobeyed, if they went after other gods, then what would follow would be disinheritance and destruction. Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15, we read, you shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you, 
For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. They were threatened, they were warned, they knew that this kind of behavior was going to lead to that kind of destruction. And then in uh, 1 Kings 14 verses 15 and 16, The Lord will strike Israel as a reed is shaken in the water and root up Israel out of this good land that he gave to their fathers and scatter them beyond the Euphrates because they have made their Asherim provoking the Lord to anger. And he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned and made Israel to sin. So there's that direct prophetic word. Because you have made these altars, because you have served these idols, I'm going to destroy you, disinherit you, and scatter you across the nations. The people of Israel knew better. They should have seen their sin. They knew what they were guilty of and they should have recognized it and they should have been grieved. They should have been terrified because they knew the consequences and they should have been eager, thirsty. They should have been desperate to repent and be restored unto their God. They should have recognized what they had done and been provoked to action to remedy their situation. But far from the godly grief that would have been appropriate for the people of Israel, far from urgency to address their sin, instead, they were at ease. And God doesn't just accuse them of being at ease, but he actually describes what he's talking about in verses 4 through 6. He says, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst who sing idle song to the sound of the harp and who like David invent for themselves instruments of music who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest of oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. They weren't disturbed by their sin, but they were distracted by the material comforts that were all around them. The wealth, the comfort, the ease, the excess, the luxury, that's what they were after. That was the primary pursuit of the people of Israel. It wasn't obedience, it wasn't holiness, it wasn't righteousness, but it was material good, comfort, ease. Instead of grieving over their sin. And God makes this direct contrast in verse six. He says, they do all these things, but are not grieved over the ruin of Jacob. The nation is crumbling around them. The foundations of the nation, the the moral, the, the covenant foundation has been violated, destroyed. They're guilty. And instead of grieving over that and trying to amend their ways, instead of repenting, they are distracted and pursuing the goods of the world. They're distracted with worldly pursuits. And it's not the things that are in themselves sinful. Sometimes when we look at passages like this, we can jump to the extreme and say, all of these things are sinful and there's no place for them, or we can get very defensive. So does this mean that we can't enjoy good things? One of the examples he uses in there is David and the instruments that he played and invented and the music that he wrote. David obviously glorified and honored God with the, the beauty of music and with the instruments that he played using his gifts for the glory of God. And so it's not that these things are in themselves sinful. There's a place for all of them. But the problem is when these become the primary pursuit, when these become the end in themselves, instead of taking the good things that God has given to us and praise God, he's given us a lot of good things to enjoy in this creation. He's poured out blessings on us for not just, you know, utilitarian use, but for genuine enjoyment. We can use those things, but if those are the ends in themselves, if that's the end goal, if that's the primary pursuit, if we're doing, you know, all of these things just for their own sake and not for the sake of advancing the glory and the kingdom and the majesty of God, that's when it becomes sinful. And I think the perfect word to describe where the sin of Israel lied is in verse five, when he says they sing idle songs to the harp. 
Because there are good songs to sing. There are songs that glorify and exalt God. There are battle songs that proclaim the victory of God and the judgment on his enemies. There are good, profitable, edifying songs. But he said they're singing idle songs. They're wasting time. They're not doing anything useful or profitable. They're just taking in these blessings and they're wasting them, spending them on nothing. That's the problem. Are these things being used in their proper purpose for the glory of God and for our good and the advance of his name and his kingdom? Or are they the end in themselves? Or even worse, and what also was going on in Israel, are these things a hindrance to offering God the obedience that we're commanded to offer? Because that's the other problem. There's a time and a place and a season for everything. As I mentioned, there are periods of rest where, yeah, we're going to be more free to simply enjoy the fruits of blessing and obedience. But in this time with Israel, when the sin was rampant, when things were crumbling, when the judgment was on the horizon, just a generation away before the people were scattered, there was no urgency. The people were fat and they were prosperous. So what did any of it matter? Who cares what uh, high places they were going to to worship? Who cares what idols they were serving? They were doing fine. Like I said, it was a period of relative peace and prosperity for the kingdom. Borders were secure. Enemies were subdued. Things were going well. So really, who cares what's going on with the covenant and with God's law? Who cares about the disobedience? We're doing all right. That was the spirit of the people of Israel. The pursuits of the comforts of this life were not only a distraction to them, but they were a hindrance in their pursuing genuine repentance and obedience. And I think all of you know that we ourselves are guilty of this exact same spirit in our day. And we have to understand, of course, that America is not Israel. We are not a covenant nation. We don't have the promised material blessings on the same terms that Israel had them. Israel was unique in history for God's redemptive historical purposes. We are not Israel. However, we are a nation with a rich Christian heritage, and we are a nation that has been richly blessed by God with great liberty and with great prosperity, thanks in large part to that Christian heritage, to the Christian worldview being applied in this nation. And furthermore, We live in God's world. God created this world with certain laws, certain structures, certain rules. And one of the principles of God's world that he created is that sin has consequences. Sin leads to death. That's the, you know, naturally. When we sin, it leads to death, it leads to destruction, and it leads to disarray. And so judgment does come for sin. And oftentimes we want to say, well, that was then God judged Israel. They were his special people, but we're not a covenant people. So we don't have the same threats of judgment. But remember, Amos had just finished prophesying against all these nations that were not covenant nations. They weren't nations that were in a special relationship with God. And yet they were judged by God, held accountable to the law of God, punished for their wicked sin against the God who created them. And when you consider our nation, which has centuries of gospel light that we enjoy, we have billions of Bibles, and yet the fact that we have rejected and spurned all of that for the sake of our wickedness and sin and pursuing the lusts of our flesh, how can God not pour out judgment on America? How can he not? The sin of our nation, as we know, is grievous, and and we stand condemned by it. This has gone on on our watch. You know, we like to think of, you know, the the Nazis are sort of the gold standard of wickedness. Everyone can agree in condemning the Nazis. No one's going to stick up for them. And what did they do? They they executed the Holocaust. They, you know, committed genocide against an entire group of people. They were a totalitarian state that didn't uh 
that did not allow dissent. They were in favor of eugenics, of medical experimentation to produce, you know, better human beings. That's what they were all about. And we know we can't defend ourselves. We systematically and in huge, massive numbers slaughter an entire group of people, the unborn, who have no protection under the law, even today, a year after Roe versus Wade was overturned, by the way. We commit what we call gender affirming care is the most brutal, gruesome medical experimentation that can be conceived of. We're chopping people up. We celebrate publicly the wickedness of our nation. Every perversity, every moral atrocity is not only done in our nation, but is celebrated in our nation's capital, in public, and all throughout the streets of the United States. We don't even try to hide our sin. We have pride in our sin. And so we are just as bad as any other nation that you can think of in history. How can we avoid the judgment? Just like Israel, who had their high places where it was public, it was normative, it was expected. This was just part of life. In our day, the wickedness, the perversion, and not just the most extreme kinds, but even you know fornication, premarital sex, divorce, all the rest of it, that's just part of life in America. We don't think twice about it. We are guilty. What do we deserve if Israel deserved destruction and exile? If Egypt and the Philistines and all the pagan nations deserved destruction? What do we deserve? How are we not compelled to action? How are we not grieved daily for the sin of our nation? Where is the church's desperation to turn, to repent, to proclaim Christ and his law and his rule and his glory and his goodness? Where is our urgency? Yes, we acknowledge the wickedness. I know every single one of you in here will condemn everything that I just talked about. You will say that it's wicked. You'll say that it's an abomination and that it ought not to be. We will voice our disapproval. We'll disdain it. And yet, you know that it's true. All of us, we are still at ease. The wickedness in our land is unfathomably great. And yet, we're at ease. We have our jobs, we have our families, we go to restaurants, we go on vacation, we do all the normal things that we always did, and we enjoy them. So much is still normal. And yes, we'll consume enough of the news to be properly outraged and to know which companies to boycott. We'll cast our votes, but we won't truly engage in a way that's going to cost us our comfort and our affluence. We're not going to actually do something that's really going to cost us. We're so preoccupied with the things that we're doing in this world. We're preoccupied with our next home project. We're preoccupied with saving for a new car or for planning our next trip, watching our shows, consuming our sports. That's what we're so preoccupied with. And again, like I said earlier, we don't want to go to that automatic extreme. Are you saying that there's no place for any of this? Are you saying we can't watch TV or go out to eat? Of course not. These things aren't automatically sinful, but I want every one of us to ask yourself this question. What are your priorities? Are you truly grieved by our nation's sin? And I mean grieved to the point that you will actually do something to take action, to put yourself at risk? Or or is your main priority maintaining your ease and your affluence, making sure that you've got enough put away to have a comfortable retirement, making sure that you have enough put away to take that next trip, making sure that you're not going to do anything that's really going to disrupt your life and your manner of living. You know, one of the sins that we very rarely think about is the sin of gluttony. We think that gluttony is just about overeating, but gluttony is, it's excess. It's going, it's, It's collected. It's an inordinate love of the things of this world. It's collecting and accumulating and hoarding. How many of us are guilty of this kind of gluttony where we're just so worried about what we have and our comfort and our affluence and we're not grieved, truly grieved by the things going on all around us and the guilt that our nation has stored up and the wrath that's going to be poured out. 
We don't get to choose our battles. You know, as I mentioned earlier, all of us have a background of we could live the faithful Christian life and still be very comfortable. We could live pretty consistently as Christians and still maintain a lot of comfort in this life. That's fading away. And we don't get to pick the time that we live in. We are not allowed in the midst of this generation. God put us here in this place and in this time, in this generation, where there's all this wickedness, where everything is falling apart all around us. We don't get to pretend like nothing's happening. We don't get to pretend like we're living in a world 50 years ago. And we don't get to just pass these problems to the next generation. That's faithlessness. God calls us to be faithful in the context where he places us. And yes, right now, he is calling his church to be faithful in the midst of a lot of trials. To be faithful in a costly way. We don't have the right to refuse that. And even though there may be a period where rest and affluence is still possible, like it was for Israel, we can be sure because we live in God's world and because God is not mocked, because God does, con- do- God does punish sin, we can be sure that judgment will come against what's happening right now. If you look in verse 8 of Amos chapter 6, the Lord has sworn by himself, declares the Lord, the God of hosts. I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his strongholds and I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. God very seriously makes a covenant on his own head. He swears an oath against himself. He says, may this be done to me and more if I'm not faithful to this word. And what is the word? I will deliver up this city. I will send the enemy to conquer this nation. I will judge this sin. God promised solemnly with sobriety that he would punish the wickedness of Israel Our nation, our sin, will have consequences. Again, we don't have the same covenant relationship with God, but sin still has consequences. And right now, there is no doubt that we are living, we are reaping the first fruits of the consequences of our sin. You can't go on living like Americans have lived for the past 60 years and not have some consequences. And we're seeing those things start to crop up. But it is foolish to believe that things can't get any worse. Look at what we're doing today. We are still meeting openly and publicly. You can still go out to a downtown city street, hand out tracts, preach the name of Christ. Most likely nothing's going to happen to you. We can still publish books. We can still produce podcasts. We can still basically live how we want to live and proclaim Christ publicly and make disciples, do the work that God has called us to do. We can do this mostly freely. Yes, right now, the light may be growing more and more dim. However, It's still present. The church is not yet underground. We're not meeting in secret in our homes yet. It's not guaranteed, though, that this will last. And it's likely that it won't last much longer if things don't begin to change, if something doesn't happen, if something isn't done. The judgment that we're experiencing right now as Americans can get much, much, much worse than it is today. And so what are we to do? What is the call? If it's not to be at ease and at rest and be affluent, then what is the call for the Christian church who is in covenant with God and has real obligations to him? The first thing that we are called to do is to repent. That is consistently the call of the prophets. They warn of the judgment to come and they say, repent, turn away, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Acknowledge and confess your sin. Repentance is the only God is the only way that God has ordained to truly deal with sin. Only by repentance. It's not about waiting for the next election, hoping we flip the Senate, trying to get the right nominee so we can have the right president, so we can pass the right policy. That is not going to do anything. That is not going to heal the wicked, wicked heart of this nation. Repentance is the only thing that we can do. Repentance, full on axe laid to the root of the tree. Repentance is what we must 
be doing. The scope of our sin demands it. And this must happen, yes, nationally, but it begins personally. Personal repentance. Don't abstract this. Don't think about this just in terms of what the world is doing, but you need to repent. And yes, you need to repent of all of your sin, but in this context, consider how have you contributed in any way to the wickedness of the world around us? How have you been silent when you shouldn't have been silent? How have you been cowardly when you should have stood up and had courage? How have you compromised with wickedness? How have you failed to deal with sin in your own home and in your own family? Repent of that. Turn from it. How have you put the pursuit of rest and of ease and of affluence over your obligations to God in this generation, in this context that we're living in? How have you been gluttonous? How have you been greedy for gain? Consider these things, truly reflect and repent of them. And repentance doesn't mean just acknowledging. It doesn't just mean you look inward, you realize you have sin and you, you know, apologize to God, feel bad for it, and then go on living the way you live. Repentance means turning away. It means changing behavior. It means setting off on a new course of obedience. And so when you're convicted of your sin, it's not, God doesn't call us simply to say, I feel bad about my sin, but he calls us to do something about it, to go and live differently. So repent. Strengthen Christ's people. That's the next thing we must do. Live faithfully in your family and in your church. We are called to live in a way that is sacrificial. We're called to live in a way where we put the needs of others above our own. We are called to live out the work that Christ has done in our hearts publicly and in real relationships with others. We are to spend ourselves, spend your time, spend your energy, spend your money on the people who are around you, on bearing the burdens of others, live in true community with one another. See, the world shows, you know, you can look at, a pride parade, or you can look at, you know, social media and see the way that so many in that, in the sinful world live. The world presents a very public picture of what a life looks like when it's given over to sin. And what's the picture? It's destruction. It's chaos. It's depravity. And ultimately it's death. The church is supposed to be a picture to the world of what a life looks like when it's lived to the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. We are to give the world a picture of a different kind of life. The world is constantly showing this picture of their ideal life, of gender fluidity and androgyny and sexual promiscuity. That's what the world is presenting. We as the church need to publicly present a vision and a reality of life lived in joy, thanksgiving, faithfulness, community, sacrificial love. That's the thing that transforms the world. When Christians actually live like Christians in real life with one another, that changes things. So strengthen Christ's people and live faithfully in your family and in your church. And then finally, proclaim Christ everywhere. Don't wait for things to change by themselves. Don't bank on a political move or a political party. Don't bank on, well, public opinion on this is starting to shift. Christ is the only one who can redeem the lost who are among us. The name of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what people need. So proclaim Christ publicly. Actually go and take this message to the lost. Actually go, be the prophet like Amos is being. You have been given the words of eternal life. You have been given the gospel of Jesus Christ. Take it out of here, bring it out of the world. Call out the sin of the world and offer them the free grace and repentance that comes comes in Jesus Christ. Too many of us, far too many of us, will simply write this off and say, well, I'm not gifted in that area. Meanwhile, the world is falling apart, and we like to complain about it, but what do we do about it? And I know it's not always going to be on the street evangelism or open air preaching, although many more of us need to be willing to do that kind of ministry. The lost are not hiding. They're not hard to find. Go get them with the gospel. But even 
even down to the conversations we have. How many of us have conservative friends who will comment on how crazy the world is and we'll just roll our eyes and say, oh yeah, times are pretty crazy right now, when we should take that as an opportunity to challenge them. Well, why is all this wrong? Bring in the gospel of Christ. That's the answer. There's a lot of people with common sense who look at the world and say that this is really messed up, but they're not Christians. They don't know Christ. Use that as an opportunity with your friends and family who hate what's going on around us. Use that to get the gospel in there. Bring them to Christ. That's the thing that changes people. The reality is that this world that we live in today is so desperate. My goodness, we are so lost and desperate. People are so desperate for hope, for identity, for meaning, that they are destroying their bodies and their lives forever because they want some sort of meaning and stability and comfort. And we have the message of Jesus Christ. We have God who took on flesh. We have the perfect man. We have identity in Christ. And we have a resurrection to proclaim that this world isn't just going to be destroyed, but it is going to be transformed. And we're going to be transformed. And your body is going to be restored. We have a message of abundant life and grace and mercy. And we're sitting on it. Go forth and proclaim this. And yes, judgment comes temporally in time and space. God punishes sin, but we have an answer for wrath. We have a sacrificial lamb who was offered up to absorb the fullness of the wrath that our sin deserves. And so you think what we're going through now is bad. What is eternity going to look like for those who don't know Christ Jesus? This is a tiny, fraction of a taste of what the sinful human heart can do, the kind of damage that it can do. What will be done for all eternity when sin is unfettered and wickedness prevails unrestrained by God's common grace? But we have the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have the actual answer for the world's need for wrath and judgment. A perfect sacrifice who bore all of it and who gives forgiveness freely for all of those who come to him in repentance and faith. We have that message. And we need to bring forth that message and live out that message even when it's costly even when it puts our ease and our comfort in jeopardy. So we should be grieved. We should be somber. We should be very serious. But we also should be joyful and hopeful and thankful because we know how it all ends. We know that death is conquered. We know that our king is risen. We know that he is seated in heaven. And we know that he will bring about all his perfect purposes and that his kingdom will come when it is consummated. And so be joyful, be thankful, and be busy about the work of the king and his kingdom.